Nico Jenkins is not over his early release, but the mental help many believe he needed. Even State Senator Ernie Chambers got involved, urging the Department of Corrections to get Nico Jenkins help. But there's no way of knowing if he ever got that help. Sources tell us Jenkins killed for the thrill of it, crossing racial and gender boundaries across town. Four murders in a month's time, including the random shootings of Andrea Kruger, Jorge Ruiz, and Juan Uribe Pena, and the death of Curtis Bradford, who Jenkins met in prison. KETV News Watch 7's Adrian Whitsett is live with tonight's big story. Months before Nico Jenkins got released from prison, months before he'd be accused of murder, State Senator Ernie Chambers says he tried to step in, forwarding letters about Jenkins' mental health, even calling DOC's director. And I had contacted the department director myself and told him, we don't want this man to come out into our community without the treatment that you can provide while he's there. Treatment State Senator Ernie Chambers says Nico Jenkins didn't get despite several warnings about his mental health and possible danger. And we have four people dead who did not have to die. And I place it at the feet of the Department of Corrections and the director, Houston, and the governor for not properly managing that department. Chambers says last year he also forwarded a letter from Jenkins' mother, Lori, to DOC and the state ombudsman. And I'm in the process of compiling documentary evidence, which is not confidential, that the department had, including a request by Nico's mother that a civil commitment be undertaken in Johnson County. State Ombudsman Marshall Lux confirmed to KETV News Watch 7 that he received the letter about Nico Jenkins. Said it wasn't surprising. They'd worked for several years advocating that Jenkins get treatment and he says they considered it a high priority case. Chambers says the DOC should have notified the Douglas County attorney as well. But in this case, didn't happen. And when you say in this case, if you're referring to Nico Jenkins, no one ever sent us a affidavit or saying you need to do a commitment because this person is not doing their treatment or they're not doing well and they're mentally ill and they're dangerous. So that, did, that didn't happen. The situation shows he needed mental help as early as the second grade. That's when he says a voice told him to bring his mom's gun to school. A voice Nico now says is an Egyptian demon forcing him to kill. KETV News Watch 7's Hannah Pickett sits down with Jenkins' wife for this rare interview. He's not pretending to be crazy. He's real life crazy. Shalonda Jenkins says in the five years she's known her husband, Nico, he suffered a plethora of mental illness and claims to be controlled by an Egyptian god, Apophis. Nico specifically told me that Apophis' gives him orders. Nico told her Apophis saved him from attempting suicide in solitary confinement a few years ago. It was this voice that came and was just like, if you do what I tell you to do, if you follow my demands, then I'll make sure you're safe and make sure you're okay. Nico claims to have heard these voices since he was a child, and it continued through his teenage and adult years. And prior to his July release from prison, Nico asked for mental help. His wife did too. I told them not to let him out. I said he's not ready to come out in society. But Nico's wife says the system failed him by not giving him that treatment. Weeks later, prosecutors say he went on a killing spree, murdering four people. I feel sorry for the, the victims. I feel sorry for all four of them. I feel sorry for people who got hurt by Nico. Now Nico awaits another mental evaluation to determine if he's even competent to stay on trial. Right now, he's not. Shalonda just hopes someone will finally help him. Whatever happens in the justice system happens, but at the same time, I just want my husband to get help, whether if he has to go to death row or whether he has to do life without parole or whatever. I just want my husband to get Problem went public. Good evening, I'm Melissa Fry. And I'm Jeremy Maskell. A deputy director of the State Department of Corrections says there was a deliberate decision by the new director to ignore a Supreme Court ruling on calculating prison sentences. That's our big story at 6 o'clock. Nebraska's deputy corrections director says a second Supreme Court order was ignored, and seven or eight inmates released too early were placed in temporary home confinement rather than being sent back to prison. They were allowed to wear electronic monitoring devices over the objections of Department of Corrections lawyer George Green, who felt the home confinement program was illegal. Corrections Director Mike Kenney is before the investigating legislative committee right now. 
Kenny says he thought he had the authority to make the new classification. Listen now to Kenny and Omaha State Senator Steve Lathrop. I decided to be the kind of director that was going to enforce the mission of the agency to reintegrate people in a successful manner that still upheld qualities of justice but didn't disrupt their lives. That's and, fine. And that's fine. That's and that's the kind of director you are, but you had to ignore the Anderson opinion and exactly what the Supreme Court told you to do with these guys when they were done. And when you found out you made a mistake and you rounded these people up and you had to look to see if they broke the law, you didn't. And when you were told by the Supreme Court opinion in Anderson that these guys owed more time, you decided not to make them serve it. Senator and Anderson. That's, no, no, okay. sir. It's the law. Senator Lathrop questioned Kenny as to who was part of the decision to create that temporary category. Kenny insists it was his decision alone, despite notes from George Green indicating the governor, attorney general, and others were part of that meeting. And there are more allegations made public in the legislative hearing investigating what went wrong in the Department of Corrections. A memo produced today also suggests Governor Dave Heineman's administration wanted to change the definition of prison overcapacity in an attempt to lower the numbers. Most of the day was spent talking about what could have been done and was not, specifically referencing the release of convicted killer Nico Jenkins. Two members of the state om ombudsman's office advised Bob Houston, the former head of corrections, that Jenkins needed to be transferred into mental health treatment. His comments were, what am I going to tell the families of staff? What am I going to tell the families of inmates if we release Nico in general population and he kills somebody. There is more emphasis on what Nico would do within the facility uh, than what he would do outside of the facility. The Ombudsman's Office representatives testified Houston felt Jenkins was manipulating the system and not in need of mental health treatment. The 10 day killing spree in 2013, just after Jenkins released from prison, all started on August 11th when Jenkins shot and killed 26 year old Juan Uribe Pena and 29 year old Jorge Cajiga Ruiz inside a pickup truck near 18th and F. Seven days later, Jenkins runs into Curtis Bradford at a party. Now the next morning, August 19th, a neighbor finds the 22-year-old shot in the head near 18th and Clark. Three days later, Jenkins targeted a young mother on her way home from work. Authorities find 33-year-old Andrea Kruger's body in the road. He is 51-year-old Warren Levering, and he's wanted as an accessory to a felony. Investigators believe Nico Jenkins had help in the murder of Andrea Kruger. And we know of at least one connection between Jenkins and Levering. KATV Newswatch 7's Hannah Pickett joins us live. Hannah? Rob, Warren Levering is Nico Jenkins' uncle, Lori Jenkins' brother. Much like Jenkins, Levering, too, has a criminal history. In fact, he was just released from prison in Oklahoma in June, two months before Andrea Kruger was murdered. Levering had served just under three years of a 10-year sentence for kidnapping and assault with a weapon. We have an active investigation. We want to maintain the integrity of that investigation. Douglas County Chief Deputy Tom Wheeler says the public played a crucial role after Andrea Kruger's death. Tips led investigators from the murder scene near 168th and Fort to her SUV near 43rd and Charles. Now they need your help again to find this man, 51-year-old Warren Levering, wanted as an accessory in Kruger's murder. We do need to get him off the street. We need to talk to him. We need to find out. Uh, we need to get some answers to some questions that we have. Investigators won't elaborate on what role Levering might have played, but they do say Levering is connected to Kruger's accused killer, Nico Jenkins, in more ways than one. Mr. Levering is Nico Jenkins' uncle and Lori Jenkins' brother, so he does have a, a relationship with Mr. Jenkins. Warren Levering also related to Jimmy Levering, who was killed in 2011. Jimmy was charged with murder in 2006, but the charges were dropped when, according to prosecutors, witnesses backed out. As for Andrea Kruger's murder, deputies say the case is far from over, that they're leaving no stone unturned in hopes of bringing everyone involved to justice. Well, we believe it's important. We've, uh, we have up to $1,000 available in Crime Stoppers uh, funds to, to, uh, to put to this effort. Uh, this, this case is active and ongoing, and we're trying to go where the evidence uh, takes us. And right now, he's an individual. We need, to be, we need to speak he with He has his past, and his M.O. is not murdering people. He, he don't have it in his heart.
Just hours after this interview, Shalonda Jenkins and two of her in-laws were taken in for questioning. Sources tell us her husband, Nico, may be connected to several unsolved homicides. Nico Jenkins and two women just arrested in the past 24 hours have not been excluded as possible suspects in the death of Andrea Kruger. Good evening, I'm Adrian Whitset, and 26-year-old Nico Jenkins was arrested Thursday on a separate warrant for terroristic threats. Only KTV News Watch 7 there late last night as investigators seized about 20 bags of evidence that may be linked to several area homicides. Omaha police served the search warrant at the Tudor Heights apartments near 108th and West Maple. And at this hour, sources tell us seven people are being questioned for several unsolved homicides. In the big story at 6, KTV News Watch 7's Hannah Pickett joins us live from Douglas County Corrections with the very latest. Hannah? Yeah, Adrian, Nico Jenkins, his sister Erica, and friend Christine Bordeaux were all arrested last night on unrelated charges. And just this afternoon, sources tell us Nico's mother, uh, his wife, another sister, and ex girlfriend have all been taken in. And we do know that in the past hour, Jenkins' mother, Lori, was booked for tampering with a witness. Meanwhile, the six others are being questioned in a string of unsolved murders. Officials won't say what they took from this Tudor Heights apartment Thursday night, but sources say evidence recovered may be connected to several unsolved homicides. This apartment near 108th and Maple is where police arrested 26 year old Nico Jenkins Thursday for an outstanding felony warrant for terroristic threats. Sources say Jenkins' ex girlfriend called police saying he threatened to kill her and her family. And the woman who reports Jenkins told her he was going to send demonic forces to her mother's house. But sources say that's just the tip of the iceberg. According to our sources, Nico Jenkins, his sister Erica, and friend Christine Bordeaux have not been excluded as suspects in the murder of Andrea Kruger. Sources say they're investigating Jenkins in the murder of Curtis Bradford three days earlier. Jenkins' wife says he was with Bradford at a party the night before witnesses found him dead, shot in the head near 18th and Curtis. Yeah, my husband was the last person that were seen with him, whether it was taking a picture, but when it was all said and done, my husband was nowhere around when he was murdered. Shalonda Jenkins is Nico's wife. I don't believe it in my heart that my man did that. No, I don't. Sources tell us minutes after this interview, Shalonda and Nico's mother, sister, and ex girlfriend were all taken in and may be questioned for unsolved murders. Evidence collected here may help unlock the case, but so far, no suspects have been officially named and no arrests have been made in connection to the Kruger or Brown. Trial on murder charges. Yeah, he's insane. He's a psychopath. He's both. You could be both. You could be insane and a psychopath. But does Jenkins understand the charges against him and what happens in court? That's what a Douglas County judge must now decide. And Judge Peter Battalion says he'll make a decision sometime tomorrow. Good evening. I'm Rob McCartney. And I'm Brandy Peterson. The judge will look at three very different accounts of a self confessed paranoid schizophrenic. The man who prosecutors say killed Andrea Kruger, Curtis Bradford, Jorge Cahiga Ruiz, and Juan Uribe Pena in just 10 days last August. KETV News Watch 7's Christina Engdahl is live at the courthouse with the big story at 6. Robin Brandy, we've heard it before. An Egyptian god speaks to Nico Jenkins, but a psychiatrist in court today says he thinks Jenkins is faking it, while another doctor from Douglas County Corrections testified of all the people he's evaluated, Jenkins is by far the most dangerous. He's in irons and locked up. He's in Mod 20. No, nobody goes near him. And Douglas County Corrections psychiatrist Dr. Eugene Alavito says no one should go near Nico Jenkins, a man he describes as aggressive, impulsive, Insane. You wouldn't want to mess with Nico and be on his bad list, I'll tell you right now. But Wednesday's hearing isn't about Jenkins' sanity. It's whether he understands the charges against him that'll determine if he's competent for trial. I mean, there's differing opinions, obviously, from the testimony, so we'll just see what the court says and, and, and we'll uh, deal with it no matter what. Testimony from three psychiatrists. The first, Dr. Y. Scott Moore, who suggests Jenkins may be faking for secondary gains. And then Dr. Bruce Gutnick, hired by Jenkins' attorney. He diagnoses Jenkins with schizoaffective disorder, a combination of schizophrenia and personality disorders like narcissism, paranoia. So a person can be mentally ill and still be competent. But Nico Jenkins' public defender Tom Riley says it can be a fine line, especially since Jenkins has repeatedly said he can't even trust his own attorneys. When clients of ours have mental illness, that's not an uncommon situation. 
But as to whether Jenkins is faking that illness, Riley says the only way to know is professional opinion. You have to rely on the history and the, you know, uh, in some ways, how they react to medication. And in court, Dr. Alavito testified that Jenkins took medication for two weeks at DCC and reacted, quote, wonderfully, but says Jenkins stopped when denied lunch. Assistant Douglas County Attorney Brenda Beadle calling that manipulative behavior, saying Jenkins simply has no regard for rules. We'll make that decision here in the courthouse behind me whether or not Nico Jenkins is mentally competent for trial. But a mental health professional is critical in that conversation about competency. And tonight, we get an inside look at what those professionals are looking for. So these competency hearings are set up to make sure that we have the fairest process possible. Dr. Kirk Newring has years of experience evaluating people about to stand trial. He has no affiliation with Nico Jenkins' case, but he did talk with us about what's involved in those critical conversations about competency. Two things especially. First, an understanding of how the court process works. Who's the judge? Who's their attorney? What happens? And the other part is their ability to participate in the process. That may be key for Jenkins on Wednesday. In a letter written to KETV dated January 10th, Jenkins said based on his interpretation of state law, he's mentally ill, arguing the state is responsible for past injuries he inflicted on himself while in custody. A psychiatrist evaluated Jenkins late last year and said he is mentally competent for trial. Both defense attorneys and prosecutors get to weigh in Wednesday before a judge decides. If the judge rules Jenkins is unfit, the state's goal often becomes what doctors call restoration. And that might be where they would end up being remanded to the regional center for custody and then provided treatment to help restore competence. But Dr. Newring is quick to caution competency can be fluid, called into question several times throughout a lengthy trial with doctors paying close attention to a defendant lying about illness. And that's one of the things you want to look for in any evaluation. What are the benefits to this person for feigning a mental illness? What are the advantages for this person feigning that he doesn't have a mental illness? And there might be advantages on both sides. The gallery where the victim's friends and family listened to testimony here in the jailhouse courtroom and the loved ones stared right back. We learned today the case against Nico Jenkins is being built with the words of his cousin. In chilling detail, she's telling investigators what led to four different murders. Tuesday morning, the families of Nico Jenkins' alleged victims heard from investigators two different versions of motives in their loved one's death. Nico Jenkins told investigators he was simply acting on the orders of Egyptian demons and killed people as sacrifices for the gods. But his cousin Christine Bordeaux told investigators a different story, how he was short on money and wanted to rob people and says she was there for three of the murders. It's quite a different picture that's painted when you talk to people who as the evidence came out today that we're with him versus what he says uh, why he did what he did. In the case of Andrea Kruger, Bordeaux told investigators Erica Jenkins was driving Bordeaux, Nico, and their uncle Warren Levering in one of Nico's girlfriend's cars. Bordeaux says they were out looking for a car they liked, a car to steal, to then go rob people downtown as they left the Lil Wayne concert. Bordeaux said they watched Kruger leave a McDonald's and pulled out in front of her. When they got to the dark, desolate intersection of 168th and Fort, Nico and Levering got out. Nico told investigators he pulled Kruger out of her car, that Kruger pled with him, saying, no, no, please don't, before Nico shot her four times. Nico and Warren reportedly ditched Kruger's SUV miles away, and Bordeaux and Erica left in the car they were originally driving. As for the Curtis Bradford case, Nico reportedly told investigators he shot him in the back of the head, and when that didn't kill him, he shot him again, this time with a shotgun. And for Juan Urebe Pena and Jorge Calle Ruiz, Bordeaux told investigators she and Erica convinced the two to party with the promise of sex. Once they got to Urebe Pena's apartment, Erica called Nico, saying she thought one of the men had $1,000 cash on him. Nico told Erica and Bordeaux to get the men to Spring Lake Park, where he told investigators he shot them both in the face. Bordeaux says Nico also took one of the men's wallets. Now, the victim's families chose not to comment afterward. Defense attorney Tom Riley asked the judge to dismiss the case, but instead, Nico will stand trial for four. First decision allow a judge to determine his future, not a jury.
Good evening. At one point, today's hearing turned into a shouting match between Nico Jenkins and Judge Peter Battaglia. Yeah, the judge even slammed his hand on the bench as Jenkins tried to steer the courtroom out of control. KTV News Watch 7's Christina Engdahl watched and heard it all. She joins us live. Adrian Melissa, first Jenkins says that he wanted a jury, but ultimately he decided not to have one. But he kept circling back to two motions Jenkins says he filed concerning his rights, and every time the judge remind him that wasn't for today's hearing, and it turned into a 90-minute merry-go-round that got Jenkins one step closer to trial. Inside the courtroom, it seemed like Nico Jenkins ran the show. Soviet resurrection. Russia dictated yelling something about a socialist revolution at our cameras, and during his hearing, yelling over Judge Peter Battalion, quote, let me talk, Your Honor, you're violating my human rights. Even calling Judge Battalion prejudice, the same judge that'll oversee his trial in the absence of a jury. But right out of the gate, Jenkins made an objection. Battalion asking to what? Jenkins says he filed two motions, one saying his Miranda rights were violated after being arrested for four murders last summer. The other against Douglas County Attorney Don Klein, but Battalion says those motions were filed improperly. Partly is because the, I'm sure the defense doesn't understand procedural issues or questions, so so we'll we'll get through it. Don Klein also says they'll have a separate hearing for those motions. So we'll we have a motion to suppress, and then we'll have a uh, I assume at that date we'll get a, a trial date. But that didn't stop Jenkins from bringing it up repeatedly. At one point, Jenkins looking over at Klein and grinning. Judge Battalion scolded him, saying, quote, you only need to look up here. You don't need to make faces. Jenkins saying, I only smiled. Battalion arguing back, while well, smiling is a face. It's a little bit a different situation, obviously, when you have somebody pro se, and I think the judge is doing a fine job just handling it. Now, we also know that today Jenkins filed a federal complaint against Judge Peter, Peter Battalion. And, of course, Jenkins, acting as his own attorney, says that he still needs to get some evidence from the prosecution. But Don Klein asked that witnesses' addresses and phone numbers be removed before they hand months that over. Before Nico Jenkins got released from prison, months before he'd be accused of murder, State Senator Ernie Chambers says he tried to step in, forwarding letters about Jenkins' mental health, even calling DOC's director. And I had contacted the department director myself and told him, we don't want this man to come out into our community without the treatment that you can provide while he's there. Treatment State Senator Ernie Chambers says Nico Jenkins didn't get, despite several warnings about his mental health and possible danger. And we have four people dead who did not have to die. And I place it at the feet of the Department of Corrections and the director Houston and the governor for not properly managing that department. Chambers says last year he also forwarded a letter from Jenkins' mother, Lori, to DOC and the state ombudsman. And I'm in the process of compiling documentary evidence, which is not confidential, that the department had, including a request by Nico's mother that a civil commitment be undertaken in Johnson County. State Ombudsman Marshall Lux confirmed to KETV News Watch 7 that he received the letter about Nico Jenkins. Said it wasn't surprising. They'd worked for several years advocating that Jenkins get treatment, and he says they considered it a high priority case. Chambers says the DOC should have notified the Douglas County attorney as well. But in this case, didn't happen. And when you say in this case, if you're referring to Nico Jenkins, no one ever sent us a affidavit or saying you need to do a commitment because this person is not doing their treatment or they're not doing well and they're mentally ill and they're dangerous. So that did that did. easy. Closure? No. Do I have questions? Absolutely. As deputies surround the suspected killer in court, a judge refuses bail for Nico Jenkins. Good evening. I'm Adrian Whitsett. I'm Melissa Fry. Jenkins is charged with four counts of first degree murder, accused of taking the lives of Jorge Cajia Ruiz, Juan Uribe Pena, Curtis Bradford, and Andrea Kruger. Tell us this man, Anthony Wells, provided a gun to Nico Jenkins shortly after his release from prison. We've also learned sources say this surveillance picture shows Christine Bordeaux buying the ammunition. More details on all that in a moment. First, this case is what Senator Anna Pickett was what happened inside the courtroom. Anna. Okay, Adrian, the courtroom today was full of 
victim's family and loved ones. Nico Jenkins made his first court appearance on four murder charges. Later in court, Jenkins' sister has a major outburst, forcing four deputies to literally carry her out of the courtroom. Prosecutors say senseless crimes bring these two families together to see this man, Nico Jenkins, firsthand. The man prosecutors say murdered their loved ones. For me and the way Andrea and I were, I needed to at least see him in person. It wasn't really anything more than I just think an experience that I had to. It wasn't easy. I didn't really want to, but something deep down just you know told me, and, I, and I'm happy I came. The families of Andrea Kruger and Curtis Bradford watched as deputies surrounded a handcuffed Nico Jenkins and listened as Judge Joseph Caniglia ordered he be held on no bond. There looks like there's no remorse. For Andrea Kruger's brother, this is the start of closure, but for her husband, it's still too fresh. Closure? No. Do I have questions? Absolutely. And as these grieving families ask why, prosecutors say this man, Anthony Wells, gave Jenkins a gun shortly after his prison release. He's held on $1 million bond. As for Jenkins' relatives, his mother and two of his sisters remain jailed on unrelated charges, but are being questioned in four murders. Erica Jenkins had to be carried out of court Thursday by four deputies after an outburst on a charge of assaulting another inmate. She swore at Judge Caniglia and kicked over a podium, nearly hitting one of the prosecutors. The women who may be linked to the homicides is recorded on camera buying ammunition. Now, two days after the murder of Andrea Kruger, Omaha police were looking for information about this woman. We were told she was considered a, quote, person of interest in a homicide investigation. And KTV News Watch 7 has learned the woman pictured is Christine Bordeaux, Bordeaux who may be linked to the Kruger murder. Bordeaux is jailed on a federal charge for being a felon in possession of ammunition. Sources tell us these are photos of Bordeaux purchasing 12 gauge ammunition from Omaha's Canfield Sporting Goods. Now, the president of Canfield tells us she was on the phone the entire time asking the person on the line that if this is what the person wanted and then bought two boxes. Those surveillance cameras just installed a few months before. This is audio from Bordeaux's federal court appearance Wednesday afternoon. Ms. Bordeaux, the uh, complaint charges you with on August 2, 2013, you were a previously convicted felon, and on that day you were in possession of ammunition, specifically 12 gauge classic magnum shells. Again, the date of the purchase was August 2nd. Investigators allege Nico Jenkins' murder spree started August 11th. Bordeaux has not been charged with any murder. She faces another hearing in federal court next week on the ammunition charges. And we are digging deeper into the background of Nico Jenkins. While serving time for armed robbery, he was charged with assaulting a Tecumseh correctional officer and trying to escape in December 2009. He offered a plea of guilty by reason of insanity and was charged with being a habitual criminal, but that was later dropped. In May 2011, Jenkins is transported to get a psych evaluation with Dr. Bruce Gutnix. Then in June 2011, he was sentenced two to four years in addition to the time he was already serving. In his court order, Judge Randall notes Jenkins had a, quote, serious history of mental illness which inhibits his ability to be rehabilitated, end quote. And Douglas County Attorney Don Klein indicated yesterday he will likely ask for the death penalty in this case. And it's a move that Governor Dave Heineman supports. He sent this letter to Klein saying Nebraska authorized the death penalty for situations like these four senseless murders. And he talked about that very issue during an interview with Rob McCartney. He should receive the death penalty, and we need the Nebraska judicial system and certain Nebraska lawmakers to work with us to make sure that... Robin Brandy, one of the big highlights of Jackie Tevis's law studies class out at Millard West High School is a field trip down here to the Douglas County Courthouse to see how the courts really do work. Well, this one turned out to be a lot bigger and certainly more accidental than anyone bargained for. And he just straight up barked at us. Barked at in court by accused killer Nico Jenkins, known for his rants. Oh, yeah. I'll go
Kelly Smith was there with her Millard West Law Studies class. I mean, it was a little more creepy that he was making eye contact while he did it. A routine field trip for Jackie Tevis's class to see how the courts really work. I never in a million years would have thought that we would have gotten in. The juniors and seniors in the right place at the right time for the courtroom spectacle. He's a really interesting guy, Nico is. Interesting in these legal surroundings where things are often routine. I thought there was going to be a lot more yelling and banging on tables, but it's pretty. Other than Nico, it's not a lot of yelling. The most memorable thing for me was the fact that Nico was representing himself. Uh, I thought that was like a very bold decision on his part. Jack says even he heard Jenkins making mistakes, and he says the drama was remarkable. He was just like barking at us, just yelling, and he really wanted to put on a show. Like he really wanted to make sure that like it was all worth it and that he was remembered for the horrible things he's done. Jacob Barish was also impressed by Jenkins' self-representation. Just the way he was able to, I guess, proceed in the courtroom without a lawyer was, I guess, imp I'm not trying to like gloat about him, but it was just impressive. For some, the creepiness is more memorable. He turned his chair completely around and started kind of giving us a rant and pretty much made eye contact with every single one of us. Accused murderer Nico Jenkins says he will plead guilty as soon as he's allowed to, even though his attorney advises against it. For a judge today who ordered a psychiatric evaluation, Jenkins says he has a heart and soul just like his victims, and he doesn't want to end up being chained up like an animal. KETV News Watch 7's Adrian Whitsett is live with the big story at 6. Adrian. Brandy, on a motion from the defense, a hearing here inside the Douglas County Courthouse today to see if Jenkins is mentally fit to stand trial. Jenkins just wants it to be over. He told the judge that he is sick and tired of being in court, something he's done since he was 11 years old. And he says he doesn't want the families to see heinous acts of violence. Nico Jenkins walks into court. He wants to plead guilty to four murders, telling the judge, take me to my cell death row, whatever. I put it in God's hands. Jenkins said also, if I go to psych eval and then come back for trial, I'm still going to plead guilty. Guilty, guilty, guilty. Earlier this month, a doctor found him incompetent to stand trial, an evaluation presented as evidence Monday. Judge Battalion said he has to make sure Jenkins understands, so he's sending him to the Lincoln Regional Center. After the hearing, you heard what he said. I'm not going to comment on what he has to say. Tom Riley says he told Jenkins that the judge wouldn't accept his guilty plea yet. And another doctor is going to evaluate him to determine if he's competent or not. If he says he is competent, we'll probably have to have a hearing. And Dr. Gutnick will testify that he's not competent. And whoever they have will say that he is, and the judge will have to make a decision. Certainly sounded very competent, in the, even in the courtroom, I think, with regards to what he said and how he said it. The judge and prosecutors, even Jenkins, believes he can be competent with proper medication and treatment, something that could take a few days or much longer. Even from Gutnick's report, if you read that report, it's not like this person's so incompetent that they can never be restored. He said, just said there's some issues that need to be resolved. So we'll see. Inside the courtroom is two psychiatrists testify whether Nico Jenkins is competent to stand trial on murder charges. That's right. Yeah, he's insane. He's a psychopath. He's both. You could be both. You could be insane and a psychopath. But does Jenkins understand the charges against him and what happens in court? That's what a Douglas County judge must now decide. And Judge Peter Battalion says he'll make a decision sometime tomorrow. Good evening. I'm Rob McCartney. And I'm Brandi Peterson. The judge will look at three very different accounts of a self-confessed paranoid schizophrenic. A man who prosecutors say killed Andrea Kruger, Curtis Bradford, Jorge Cahiga Ruiz, and Juan Uribe Pena in just 10 days last August. Rob and Brandi, we've heard it before. An Egyptian god speaks to Nico Jenkins, but a psychiatrist in court today says he thinks Jenkins is faking it, while another doctor from Douglas County Corrections testified of all the people he's evaluated, Jenkins is by far the most dangerous. He's in irons and locked up. He's in Mod 20. No, nobody goes near him. And Douglas County Corrections psychiatrist Dr. Eugene Alavito says no one should go near Nico Jenkins, a man he describes as aggressive, impulsive, insane. You wouldn't want to mess with Nico and be on his bad list, I'll tell you right now. 
But Wednesday's hearing isn't about Jenkins' sanity. It's whether he understands the charges against him that will determine if he's competent for trial. I mean, there's differing opinions, obviously, from the testimony, so we'll just see what the court says and, and, and we'll uh, deal with it no matter what. Testimony from three psychiatrists. The first, Dr. Y. Scott Moore, who suggests Jenkins may be faking for secondary gains. And then Dr. Bruce Gutnick, hired by Jenkins' attorney. He diagnoses Jenkins with schizoaffective disorder, a combination of schizophrenia and personality disorders like narcissism, paranoia. A person can be mentally ill and still be competent. But Nico Jenkins' public defender Tom Riley says it can be a fine line, especially since Jenkins has repeatedly said he can't even trust his own attorneys. When clients of ours have mental illness, that's not an uncommon situation. But as to whether Jenkins is faking that illness, Riley says the only way to know is professional opinion. You have to rely on the history and the, you know, uh, in some ways, how they react to medication. And in court, Dr. Olavito testified that Jenkins took medication for two weeks at DCC and reacted, quote, wonderfully, but says Jenkins stopped when denied lunch. Assistant Douglas County Attorney Brenda Beadle calling that manipulative behavior, saying Jenkins simply has no... Death sentence for Nico Jenkins. Justify the imposition of a sentence of death for each murder. But for the mother of one of his victims, Curtis Bradford, she can now live again. He's had power over my life for four years, and I've struggled for four years. He don't get that power today. It was the summer of 2013. Jenkins had just gotten out of prison when he went on a 10-day killing spree. First shooting Jorge Caiga Ruiz and Juan Uribe Peña. Then Curtis Bradford, and he randomly targeted Andrea Kruger, as she drove home from work in Northwest Omaha. Kruger's parents sat quietly in court, hanging on to the judge's every word, now feeling a sense of relief. We're just glad it's over with. It's been a long time, too long. Yeah. How are you, what were you thinking when you came into today? I kind of thought I'd go this direction, and I'm good with that. The Douglas County attorney says the three judges did the right thing for the families and for the community. And rest assured that Nico Jenkins will never be able to hurt anybody again on the outside. Glasgow says her son and her faith give her strength to move on. I'll never forget him. I love him forever. But it's time for me to heal, and I'm ready. So I'm ready for peace. For all the victims' families, peace and each other is what they have to hold on to now that this has come to an end. Prison. He claimed that the prison staff repeatedly ignored his claims that Apophis was giving him orders. He said that he had schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, and obsessive compulsive disorder. He said he was diagnosed with these when he was around eight or nine years old. He also claimed that the solitary confinement made his schizophrenia worse. The mental health professionals were all over the place with diagnoses in this case. This is exceedingly common with these types of high profile murder cases. Some said he had schizophrenia, Others said antisocial personality disorder. A few said that he had both disorders, along with post-traumatic stress disorder. Some believe that Jenkins was faking psychosis, and others believed he was really psychotic. On an IQ test, he scored 69. The standard deviation for an IQ test is 15 points, so he's over two standard deviations below the mean. If one regards IQ as an adequate measure of intelligence, Jenkins would be less intelligent than 98% of the population. In prison, Jenkins essentially said that he was trying to game the system. He was faking symptoms to embarrass the court. It's common that the court views those types of statements as leaning toward antisocial personality disorder and as leaning away from some type of psychotic disorder. But somebody can have either disorder and say that they're faking it. They can say they're just pretending to be mentally ill. Just saying that doesn't really point to one disorder or the other. People who are psychotic say all kinds of things that are not necessarily true. It's like people are cherry picking certain words and saying, oh look, he must not be psychotic. But if they just looked at his claims about working for Apophis, they might think he was psychotic. So the entire clinical picture must be viewed, not just certain pieces. It's worrisome to me that in such a serious case, where a lot of money is being spent to get professionals who are competent at diagnosing, we still can't get any type of agreement. There is a massive difference between faking psychosis and being psychotic. This is not a small detail. I also find it interesting that 
some of the psychotic disorder diagnoses, like schizophrenia, occurred prior to his release from prison. So it's like they're saying, look, this guy is psychotic, but then he commits a crime, and they're saying, oh, wait, we meant antisocial personality disorder, right? Who mentioned psychosis? We don't remember saying that. That seems pretty convenient if the system is trying to convict somebody and sentence them to death. After Jenkins was sentenced, his behavior remained consistent with psychosis. He said he did not kill the four people, he believes he will go to Cuba and make nuclear weapons, and he says he needs to be killed so he can be resurrected. He tried to bring an end to his own life on two occasions. He self-harmed several times using razor blades, making the prison rethink its razor blade for every inmate initiative. At one point, he tried to carve the number 666 into his head, but he did so in a mirror, so it didn't really turn out right. It was backwards. I have seen ambulances where the word ambulance was written on the hood backwards so you could read it in a rear view mirror. Maybe that's the look that Jenkins was going for. Jenkins has been described as psychopathic, manipulative, grandiose. He certainly committed a number of crimes. He seems impulsive and irresponsible. I can understand where professionals are getting the antisocial personality disorder. What I find difficult to believe is that he only has that disorder and not some type of psychotic disorder. Ultimately though, it doesn't actually matter as far as the public is concerned. Jenkins can never be released from prison. Jenkins and charged with first degree murder on trial for the 2013 murder of Curtis Bradford. Erica Jenkins already serving time for robbing two of her brother's other victims, and she's charged with conspiring to rob a fourth murder victim, Andrea Kruger. KETV News Watch 7's Alexandra Stone is live with today's developments. It took attorneys nearly three days to seat a jury to hear this case, and this afternoon, prosecutors began to spell it out. This photo shows Nico Jenkins posing with Curtis Bradford the night before Bradford's murder. Prosecutors allege Erica Jenkins and her brother Nico shot Curtis Bradford as the three planned to carry out a robbery near 18th and Clark Streets. Bradford and Nico Jenkins had met while the two were in prison. Detectives have testified Erica shot first, but Nico's shot actually killed Bradford. Today, the state says Erica complained that Nico stole her first kill. Prosecutors briefed the jury on evidence found by investigators and testimony from family members, asking the jury to hold Jenkins accountable. But lawyers representing Jenkins say the prosecution is building a case based on testimony from criminals, two of Jenkins' sisters and a cousin who the defense calls a, quote, trio of proven liars. There's just no credibility to their, uh, to their evidence. You know, we've said from the, from the get-go, we just don't believe that they have the credibility to base a, a, a verdict of guilty on, and I still believe that. swallowed a set of keys over the weekend while in prison. His sister is extremely upset. Some state leaders say it's a systematic failure that should already be fixed and one is calling for the prison director's job. That should have never happened and it was very disturbing to hear. You know? Sophia Jenkins, Nico's older sister, says when she tried to visit her brother in Lincoln on Sunday, she couldn't and couldn't believe why. She tells KMTV exclusively that her brother was strapped to a bed by correction staff when he grabbed a set of seven handcuff keys and swallowed them. It really did. It was disturbing. It was, it was heartbreaking and I, it was unbelievable. Like, I, I couldn't even imagine it. Like, really? You know, he swallowed some keys and then let alone seven keys. NDCS says staff tended to him and he didn't need to go to the hospital. But on at least 10 occasions in the last year, Jenkins has harmed himself by cutting his face and tongue and mutilating his genitals with razors and other objects. One item he used to cut his penis was a guard's badge. Because it touches something deep down inside. Senator Ernie Chambers says prison director Scott Frakes should resign because an inmate with mental illness shouldn't continuously be able to get materials that belong to guards to hurt himself. When it happens this many times, it establishes a pattern, and any competent director of a department would never let it happen. What can happen to an individual? And Senator Chambers and Senator Bob Christ are part of the Judiciary Committee that investigated his case. Chris says no one should be segregated like Jenkins was for years. And 35 to 40 percent of prison inmates have mental, behavioral, or addiction problems. 
we have to solve the equation to, to have a brick and mortar facility and psychiatric and psychological um, staff available to deal with these mental behavioral health and addiction problems. Sophia wants to know why someone like Jenkins isn't at a mental hospital when they clearly need it and it's previously been ordered. For his illness, he needs to be in a hospital and he needs to be treated for his mental illness and not in 23 hour confinement. When an individual who has been found to have mental problems of various kinds continues to engage in self-mutilation, I think it is criminal conduct and there ought to be an investigation by the county attorney or grand jury. broken off a plastic disposable razor. State Senate Ernie Chambers says it was taped to a letter and mailed to him last Wednesday by this man, Nico Jenkins, from a segregated cell at the Lincoln Correctional Center. Which is supposed to be secure and was passed to him with the indication that he can use that to cut himself further. Chambers revealed this latest twist during a hearing of a special legislative committee. It's investigating the Department of Corrections handling of the Jenkins case and other problems in the department. That's what's happening right now under the governor's administration, under the attorney general's nose. Chambers contacted Governor Dave Heineman's chief of staff and turned over the razor and letter to the state ombudsman's office. It's a scary situation because of, uh, of the... Um, history of this individual. A judge ordered Jenkins to be treated at the prison until he's deemed mentally stable to be sentenced for four counts of murder. He has a history of hurting others and self-mutilation. Happen and having him have access to this sort of thing is very troubling. In a letter to the Ombudsman, the Department of Corrections says they immediately stepped up security, not allowing Jenkins to shave in his own cell and making sure all razors are returned and accounted for. Jenkins can no longer have any contact with visitors. Luck says this recent incident shows there are some serious gaps in how the state handles the mentally ill. That was backed by testimony from mental health experts before the legislative committee. Uh, we need better services for the most severely dangerous uh, people uh, in secure settings. Whether that means a state institution or a state hospital is unimportant. Jenny, I've been covering this case for more than two years, and every time you go to court, it takes you back to August of 2013, a crime spree, a killing spree that terrorized all of Omaha. Now today, Douglas County District Court Judge Peter Battalion convicts the final suspect in that spree. Two and a half years ago, Nico Jenkins and members of his family put fear into families across Omaha. His killing spree victimized people of all races and geographic boundaries. Today, Warren Levering pleads no contest to amended charges of attempted robbery and accessory to murder. He's sentenced to 40 years in prison, but with good time, will serve about 17 and a half before being released. It was just ensuring that he would have to do at least 20 years. And he likes to be in his 70s before he's eligible to get out. On August 21st, 2013, Levering, Nico Jenkins, Nico's sister Erica, and their cousin Christine Bordeaux went to West Omaha because Nico wanted to steal a car. He liked an SUV driven by Andrea Kruger, so they got her to stop near 168th and Fort. Nico shot her four times at point blank range, killing her. He and Warren then jump into her vehicle. Levering is caught on surveillance video dousing her SUV in gasoline and starting it on fire near 43rd in Hamilton. He even had burns when he was arrested. He's always wanted to resolve the case and we all felt it was a fair resolution as to the nature of what his alleged involvement was as well as not putting the family through the ordeal of the trial. In court, Levering told the judge, quote, I never in my wildest memory would have thought this would happen, let alone I'd be a part of it. Once again, I'm sorry and apologize to the family. And I have no reason to, to doubt what he was indicating in court today. Levering didn't have anything to tell me when he left court this afternoon to head to prison. You know, we visited with the family, uh, Eric, Andrea's parents and, and her husband. Uh, we visited with the police officers involved and everybody would thought this was a good end result uh, for, for Levering's involvement. Case. Spree. Prosecutors believe Lori Jenkins bought the ammo her son Nico Jenkins used in at least three of four Omaha murders last August. In a confession in court today, but not to that. 
A jury convicted Jenkins of being a felon in possession of ammunition back in April. Today, a judge sentenced her. Senior reporter Jake Wasikowski was the only TV reporter there. He's live outside federal court with the very latest tonight. Jake. Craig and Jen, it was an extended hearing that took most of the day. Lori Jenkins sentenced to 10 years in a federal prison. Prosecutors showed that she bought Nico, her son, that ammo. Plus, she even knew about the fact that he was out killing people. Well, Lori tells a different story. This is Lori Jenkins in Douglas County Court. Today, Judge Lori Smith Camp sentenced her to 10 years in prison on each count of felon in possession of ammo. They will run at the same time, so with time served, she'll be in federal prison for about seven and a half years. The federal judge heard testimony from investigators on how Lori made statements to family that she knew her son was killing people and that she bought the ammo that ended up in his hands. Shotgun slugs from Canfields and later 9mm bullets from Saul's just hours before they were used to kill Andrea Kruger. Disappointed, yes, mm -hmm. but I, I need to emphasize really that she also expressed to me over and over and over again uh, the remorse she had for the victims and their respective families. Judge Smith Camp said no matter how the ammo got into Nico's hands, his mother was responsible. Federal sentencing guidelines allowed the court to consider how those bullets were ultimately used in the killing spree and not just the fact that she was a felon who bought them. I think it weighed heavily on the sentence. I mean, it weighs heavily on all of us that are involved in this case. This was a, I, need, I don't need to tell you, this was a, a terrible, heinous crime, a uh, series of crimes and that afflicted our community. In her words, Jenkins was able to tell her story for the first time ever. Quote, I never got rid of evidence for anyone. I didn't buy ammunitions for Nico Jenkins. I've never let anyone use my guns. I have them for my own protection. She said the ammo was for her protection and Nico's girlfriends actually gave him the bullets and shells. Lori went on to say, quote, I'm sorry for all the victims. I'm sorry for everything, but I confess, I confess my sin. I am not responsible for his actions. The only thing that links me to this is that he is my son. The actions that were taken by your son, Nico Jenkins, she condones none of it. Broken off a plastic disposable razor. State Senate Ernie Chambers says it was taped to a letter and mailed to him last Wednesday by this man, Nico Jenkins, from a segregated cell at the Lincoln Correctional Center. Which is supposed to be secure and was passed to him with the indication that he can use that to cut himself further. Chambers revealed this latest twist during a hearing of a special legislative committee. It's investigating the Department of Corrections handling of the Jenkins case and other problems in the department. That's what's happening right now under the governor's administration, under the attorney general's nose. Chambers contacted Governor Dave Heineman's chief of staff and turned over the razor and letter to the state ombudsman's office. It's a scary situation because of uh, of the um, history of this individual. A judge ordered Jenkins to be treated at the prison until he's deemed mentally stable to be sentenced for four counts of murder. He has a history of hurting others and self-mutilation. Happen and having him have access to this sort of thing is very troubling. In a letter to the ombudsman, the Department of Corrections says they immediately stepped up security, not allowing Jenkins to shave in his own cell and making sure all razors are returned and accounted for. Jenkins can no longer have any contact with visitors. Luck says this recent incident shows there are some serious gaps in how the state handles the mentally ill. That was backed by testimony from mental health experts before the legislative committee. Uh, we need better services for the most severely dangerous uh, people uh, in secure settings, whether that means a state institution or a state hospital.